So let's continue. Um, so far we talked mainly about feature-based approach, so only about feature-based approach. So the carbon filter, extended carbon filter, task time so far, all of these approaches used um, landmark-based approaches. Um, today we'd like to introduce an alternative technique to landmarks, which are so-called grid maps, which have some advantages over um, features, but also some disadvantages. As it is always the case, there is no, typically no best solution um, at all. And, but this is an, a representation which is quite often used, especially here at Freiburg, we work a lot with grid maps. Um, the advantage of those grid maps is that you don't need a feature extractor that you need to define beforehand. So if you want to operate in an environment, you typically need to know what you expect to write a feature detector which detects the features, like the trunk of the trees or some visual features or something like that. So I mean, for the visual domain, there are some features which work quite well in general, but for other um, techniques like, for example, for laser scanners, uh, it's not that obvious which feature uh, extraction method is works very, very well or is best. And so grid-based grid approaches, especially in the context of laser range scanning, can be quite popular. So um, as I said, we have feature-based approaches like this image. So this is copied from the first introductory lecture that I gave compared to um, other representations. So photometric representations, for example, we escape, we here see the building, so building 51, 52 here of the campus. Or what you typically find when we refer to the grid map is this kind of representation where you can actually see there are more or less like floor plan maps. So like the architectural drawing, although it's not a drawing, but they appear some resembling to this. So you can see in the corridors, white means free space, black means obstacles. And so these are typical grid map representations. And um, I would like to introduce those grid map representations today and um, also tell you how to build grid maps based on sensor data. Um, but because this will be kind of the building block for what we're going to do next week, which is introducing a fast land like algorithm, so raw black lines particle filter for addressing this land problem in the context of those grid maps. So if we don't have features which we know beforehand, we just have proximity measurements, for example, from the laser range finder, which tells us in this direction there's an obstacle in three meters before the air is likely to be free space. That's the information we can actually incorporate in such a grid representation. Um, as I said, the um, features are kind of the natural choice for the Kalman filter based approaches because you just need to estimate an x and y location. You can actually also adjust this x y location. So the position of the feature, and um, so the advantages of features is that they are a very compact representation. For example, for a point feature, I just need to store where it is, and um, in this way, have a very comp compact representation. And if I have multiple observations of that feature, I can actually refine the position estimate of this feature. There's an uncertainty in my measurement, in my center, and this is an advantage. Or this comes naturally from the EKF update rule that we typically use for feature-based mapping. Um, so for integrating, for example, multiple Gaussians into one belief, and this is one of the advantages of features. Grid maps take an alternative approach. They say we simply take the world as it is and discretize it into cells. You can see there's a discretization of the space into kind of a checkerboard-like pattern or a checkerboard-like structure. So just a regular grid. And this grid is a rigid structure, so it doesn't move. So we just kind of define a grid um, in the environment. And then um, the assumption that um, grid maps do is say every of those cells, so every of these kind of small areas which represent an area in the environment, can be either free or occupied. Is it free? It means a road refractor can drive through it, doesn't observe anything in that cell, or it sees an obstacle, so it knows an obstacle it cannot go there. And so the advantage is this kind of a non parametric model in the sense that we do not need a parametric form like the Gaussian distribution, which we use for the features, to represent the feature itself. So we just say we don't know anything about features, we just kind of maintain a histogram for every cell which says the two bit histogram is either occupied or free. That's what we actually. Um, the problem of grid-based maps is, is that they require quite a substantial number of memory resources. Actually, especially if you all have a large 2D environment, it grows quite radically with the kind of size of the environment or linearly with the area. And or even worth in 3D, where you have uh, where the hay also matters, and then it's a cubic complexity in the lines 
of the environment, the size of the environment. Um, but the advantage is they don't rely on a specific feature detector. So here's an example on what an environment looks like. So this is actually the um, building 79 in Freiburg, so that's my office over here. Um, and you can see that it's at least, it looks like roughly like an architectural floor plan, except that, of course, there are tables, there are obstacles everywhere in every room. And so these um, rooms, so it's all kind of an empty architecture drawing. And if you actually zoom in here, you can see these kind of black cells which are occupied, some of them free. So some of the things are here artifacts created by PowerPoint and viewing that so the border should be a bit sharper. But you see actually cells also a little bit gray in here. This gray means that the system actually doesn't perfectly know if it's occupied or not, for example, it's close to a wall. Okay, so let's revisit these grid maps a little bit more into detail. What does it mean? Or what assumptions do the grid maps do? The first assumption they do is if we have a kind of discretization of the space just drawn here, every cell is either fully occupied or completely free. Completely occupied, completely free. So this is obviously a strong assumption they make. Because it could be that in reality that the wall, that this is a wall which sits somewhere in the middle of the cell. The grid map makes the assumption but fully occupied, fully empty. Or if you have a wall which is not perfectly in line with the orientation of the grid, you make so-called discretization errors. It's an assumption which is done here. And the assumption is it's either completely occupied or it's completely free. So for every cell, one of those, every of those cells is represented to some small area of the state space, we maintain a binary random variable. The binary random variable tells me this is more likely to be free or occupied. And these binary random variables, we hear, um, is often called P of MI, so it's the index of one cell. If this value goes to one, we're quite sure that it is an occupied cell. If it tends towards zero, it means it's an empty cell. And this model is the so-called occupancy of the cell. Therefore, these maps are to be called occupancy grid maps. It just tells you this random variable estimates is this cell occupied. Values, probability that this cell is occupied tends towards one, you're pretty sure that this cell is occupied. If the value goes towards zero, it means the opposite, it means it's three. So we have once for every cell one single binary random variable. So just two states which are possible, free or occupied. And we model the probability of these events. So the probability that it's either occupied or that it is free. You can see this is a two-bit histogram for free and occupied. You have probabilities. The issue is, the issue is the advantage is that these histograms need to be normalized. And therefore, it's just fine to represent more value. So for one cell, you can see that it could be occupied. Three. Let's say this is one the probability. So, for example, we could have an estimate like this. So this is three occupied. And since the sum, so p of three and p of occupied needs to be one. So p of three is one minus p of occupied. It's fine to represent one single value, which gives you the probability this p of then P3 is defined. So we just need a single double value to for every grid cell to represent that. This tells us if this cell is occupied or not. We estimate the probability for that. So every cell is a binary random variable. If the cell is occupied for sure, P of MI is 1, because we are 100% sure this cell is occupied. If we perfectly know that it's not occupied, which just means 3, so we use kind of, you should use not occupied, but Language-wise, it's nice to say free. Um, it means that P of MI is zero. If we don't have any knowledge about it, we have never observed the cell, we have no prior information, all states I have the same likelihood, simply means the probability of the cell is 0.5. You simply don't know if it's free or occupied. You don't have, say, 50% free, 50% occupied, because the maximum uncertainty I can have along a state. Yes, please. Is there also like some notion that how often we observed it? Like it might be that the cell is like half occupied and then you make a lot of observations and sometimes you see a tree, sometimes then you have zero five, but you've actually observed it a lot. Um, so this is 
So the assumption how often I have seen, we cut that in a, later on and see how the probabilities evolve, but um, the assumption that I said before in the grid cell is the cell is either fully occupied or fully unoccupied. There's nothing else which is more than that because it's the assumption of that cell. So there are other variants of grid maps which take into account if the cell is occupied, how much is it occupied, or other things. There are variants of that, but the basic grid map just makes an assumption. Fully occupied, fully free, nothing else is possible. So we stick with that thing. Um, and we also assume an important thing is that the state is static. That means it doesn't change. We just want to estimate if it's free occupied. So that means we don't have any dynamics in this scene. We don't have persons walking around which you want to model or something like this. Just we assume a static environment here. This we want to estimate if binary random variable is important because we only, in this case, only need to consider the, the update. So it's a base filter that we'll use in the end, but we don't, we only have the update step, so to say. Because we know the state doesn't move. So there's no control, there's no someone around kind of rearranging the scene, which would be which would be a change in the state, so the state is static. I just don't know what it is, but I know it doesn't change. So it was one of the, the first key assumptions in the, uh, in the grid map. The second very, very central assumption is that all those cells are independent of each other. So there's no dependency between these two cells. These are completely independent random variables. This assumption the grid map, map does, is this assumption a valid one? What do you think or not? Independence? Yeah, why not? Uh, because if there's a wall, then it's like if the cell next to you is occupied, it's likely that you're occupied. Exactly. So it's not that um, we have a space which is completely randomly filled with clutter. So small, small elements in the size of those grid cells which are lying around. And if I, if I know something about a cell, I have no idea what these neighbors are. That is what the grid map assumes. In reality, this is not the case. So if I send the wall it's quite, and there's an obstacle, it's quite likely that the cell next to it is also an obstacle. Because the objects we have in the space are not just small blobs or blocks in the size of the uh, of the grid cell structure, but that's something which is completely ignored in this representation. We just say cell is completely independent of each other. This is important because otherwise this problem gets computationally intractable quite quickly. So but always be aware that it's an assumption. This is not tr it doesn't it's not true in reality. The same way that we say, a cell, in reality, a cell is not fully occupied or fully free. There may be states in between, like how occupied. But that's what this representation assumes. It's like the feature, may, the feature for the common for it assumes we have a Gaussian distribution, or a Gaussian distribution is well suited to model it. Just an assumption. So if these cells are independent of each other, that means the probability distribution about the map can be seen as a product of the probability distributions of the individual cells. So if I want to estimate a certain state of a map, of how likely is that, I just have to compute a product over all those cells. Kind of standard independent assumptions. M is to be the map, M I is to be the cell. Any question about that? So that's something, it's a direct consequence of the independent assumptions, that the cells are independent of each other. If they, wouldn't be, if they would not be independent, this wouldn't hold. So there would be some condition here, for example, on all the neighbors or something like that. But that's the assumption that the grid map does. Uh, yes? What, what is, uh, PMI is still... Uh, so MI is an individual cell. So the whole thing is a map, and this is a P1, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, M6, M7, M8, M9, M10. Yeah, but it still uh, means uh, if it's occupied or not. Yes, exactly. We are only talking about occupancy here. Yeah, but what is the meaning then of PM? PM is you want to estimate, for example, I like give you, given a, a special instance like cell 1 is occupied, cell 3 is free, yeah. cell 4 is occupied. What's the probability of this map? Given you have a model, you can just iterate over all cells and kind of take every dimension you have in here and estimate it under the individual probability. So this M is one specific instance of a map. Let's say um, so you're interested 
in does the world look like that? Yeah. So this so this is your M. Then uh, this guy be M1, M2, M3, and M4. What's the probability of that this map occurs? So this is actually P of M, and this is M, so this specific instance is given by the product over the individual cells. P of M I equals so the corresponding state in M. And this is then given in this case by P of M1 times, so this occupied, the other one should be free, so it's 1 minus P M2, 1 minus P M3, and 1 minus P M4. That's what that means. <coughs> and if the independence assumption wouldn't hold, it wouldn't be a product of these individual distributions. These terms would be more complicated. Yes, please. So this, <coughs> this just shows me to what degree the map is occupied. So it it told, tells you for every individual cell, is this occupied or not? No, I mean, uh, this, uh, so product P. The product it would be mean if so the instance of the map you're interested in, so consider this as if you have 100 cells, this is a 100 dimensional vector. You can query if all of them are free, but means just, does this random variable equal to something else? So I mean, this kind of short form, in the theory you would have to write this is P of M equals one instance. Like, also is P of X. We always write P of X, but what we in reality mean is P of that random variable which corresponds to this equals this small x that the robot is at the position whatever one one zero. And this is the same here. It means is that this map, if you pick M, is exactly one instance of a map which says the first cell is occupied and all other cells are free. And they are compared to computers according to this form. I understand this. It just doesn't make sense to me why this so value is interesting at all. It, you may, have, you may say, I have an, uh, an algorithm which estimates me this probability distribution of the individual cells. You know, I can say, does the world look like this? Or, does the world look like this? Or, does the world look like this? For all of these events, you can compute the probability and say, this one is five times more likely than that one, for example. Well, we see the same value in all of these. Or you can say for all of them are occupied. Because these are all just different instances of M's. And for every of those M, I can compute the probability. So it's actually, it's, it's a quite simple concept. So probably you think about something more complex. The reason why it's a product is just because I make these hard assumptions. Just an assumption I do. I just say that's the way it is. I assume it to be independent, and that's a direct result of this. You may argue it doesn't make sense because this cell is occupied, it's more likely that this one is also occupied. But that's completely ignored. So that's not what I mean. Okay. I mean if, if I calculate this product, it just um, means the product of all my m values. So all the values, m is between 0 and 1, depending if it's occupied or not, right? And then. Those three examples we just saw on the, on, the, on the board with the four cells and one is almost occupied. Yeah. Then it doesn't matter which which cells occupy, it's going to be the same value. Okay, so then let's. This is not the case. Um, let's see this, this thing here as M. Let's say if I write the one in here to put out confusion. You can see this is a vector which says 1, 0, 0, 0. But this is M1, M2, M3, M4 of these cells. This means here, this corresponds to now as 1, 1, 1, 1. So it's a four dimensional vector, and these dimensions are completely independent. And this one over here corresponds to 1, uh, 0, 0, 1, 0. So just possible instances. And what I do is just say, if you want to compute the probability that this that the world looks like this, it just means I can go over all the individual dimensions and compute them separately. So just see this M as a high dimensional vector, 
And it just says, I can actually compute this by taking the value of this, the value of this, the value of this, the value of this. I don't have to compute this as a whole vector. Does this answer the question? Okay. Maybe it's worth this problem as well. I think the problem was just that on the slide before, PMI was always saying one if it's occupied and zero if it's not occupied. Because it was for a single cell. Yeah, and now it's something like And all the math is just it's a collection of cells. Okay, so what I typically want to do, what I, don't, what I want to do is I want to estimate the state of the map given sensor data. So given sensing locations and observations. So this is also, you can say this is mapping with known pulses. So similar to updating an EKF for every individual landmark without taking it on called robots pulses. Which kind of the equivalent of what we are doing here is this mapping with known pulses. And that's the thing I want to do. So I want to now introduce you how to compute the probability of a map given observations and data. Because that's what we want to do in the end. We have observations. Assume we know the poses, so this way in the end, next week, the count of the, the particle will double key to estimate those x. So given we have the x and the observations, we want to compute the map estimate. And so what we want to come, come up with here is that for every cell, we say, well, this cell is occupied with a probability 80%. This cell is occupied with a probability 20%. This cell is occupied with a probability 100%. That's what I want to come up with. So that means for every individual cell, I want to have a probability value, which tells me how, how, how certain am I that this cell is occupied or not. So if it's a value close to 1, it means I'm quite sure that this cell is occupied. If it's a value towards 0, I'm quite sure that this cell is free. What if, say, one of those, uh, the probability of so PMI in one case is 0? It just means that this cell, you're sure it's not occupied. And every every map you put in which claims that this cell is occupied will have a probability of zero. It just says, I say, I'm 100% sure that this cell with the sponge is, this is occupied. I'm 100% sure. So every map which comes in and I should kind of evaluate what the probability of that map, if I check that cell, this cell, the map says it's free, is it? then the whole map has a zero probability because I know the world doesn't look like that if I know that this cell is occupied. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I want to do now, I want to estimate the state of this binary random variable for every cell individually. So if I have this product, it means I can estimate every cell individually. I don't have to take the whole map complex dependencies into account. I can just can consider every cell individually. Right? Okay. <coughs> well, technically, to estimate the state of a binary random variable, <coughs> random variable in general is a base filter, as you've known it. This is exactly what we're doing. We're applying a base filter, a special instance of a base filter, which is a binary base filter here with the, uh, for a static state. So we know the state doesn't change, and we know we just have true or false, it just can be true or false. So it's a dramatically simplified problem compared to general state estimation where you want to estimate the state of an arbitrary random variable and you have controls so the state may change over time. It's just a very, very simplified case. It means while we are observing those cells, the cells do not change. And the values cannot, the cell in reality is either true or false, nothing else is possible. So it's a very, very simplified problem. It's a binary based filter for the steady state. That's what we're going to look into now. How does this work? Okay, what we want to estimate, now we just look into the individual cell, is the probability that this cell MI is occupied given all our sensor readings and all of the pulses from which this cell reading has been uh, recorded. Okay? The first thing we apply is Bayes' rule, and what we do is we move the ZT here, the MI goes here. So we have P of ZT given MI and all other observations times P of MI given V from 1 to T minus 1 divided by P of DT given the rest. Just standard application of base rule. Any questions about that so far? Okay, so let's make a mark of assumptions here. 
which information we may ignore in this case. So which of these terms we can actually simplify? So this term exactly here, if, if I know the state of the cell, if I would know what the cell is, cell is and I know from which this, this the current measurement has been recorded, so Vt, all the previous posts and all the previous measurements can be ignored. So same in the observation, the same assumption we did in the observation model in the past. If you do that, you can do the Markov assumption and end up with this term. So here simply, the, the, all the observations are gone and all pulses up to time t are gone. So all the xt is here. Right? Is it clear? So given I know what the world looks like, what the map is, I don't need to know what I observed before, just need to know where I am, what does the world look like. So I can actually compare the observation I guess, for example, my predicted observation. As we did that so far before, the weighting step of the Kalman filter, uh, the particle filter, and also any else. So it was kind of the standard. Okay, so the next thing I do, I said, let's say, let's look to this term which now sim has simplified. Wait, please. Why doesn't the Markov assumption apply to the other terms? Oh, we'll do that later on. No, we'll, so we can do the same thing here as well. So we can get rid of this guy. That's exactly this. I can, I can also eliminate this one here. This one I cannot eliminate because here I don't know the state. This is just step in the second Markov step which comes in the second. And this will remove this one. But I can also remove this one over here directly. Next thing I do, I apply base rule. Just take this term and apply base rule again here. So this is P of MI given that D and T times P of CT given X without the state. This term right here. So now just take this equation and plug it in here. So I end up having this long formula again. So that's it, no, nothing else than applying base rule, the market assumption base rule again. And then I can do the next step to get a market assumption, exactly what you did. You can throw away this term down here, which is an error. This should be x1 to t. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a mistake. Sorry for that. This should be x1 to t. And um, the other thing I can ignore, the probability of the state, if I don't have any observation, is completely irrelevant where the robot is. So these two terms go away, but they simplify to these two terms. So the error has no further consequences because many may get rid of it in the Markov assumption. And so just in the Markov assumption, the two terms don't. Um, I don't understand why for the second term, x3 was disappeared. Um, because it's just about what I measure, but without having any knowledge about the world, it doesn't tell me anything. So I can say, if I know where I am, and I know what the environment looks like, it tells me something about what I will measure. That's what we going to If I just know I, I am somewhere, but I have no idea about what the environment looks like, I'm completely blind, I have no idea what I'm going to measure. So it's just, the, the main difference is really that the the, the, the map states or the MI is not there anymore. It wouldn't hold. So if here, in this terms, the map would be given, this would be wrong. But since I don't know anything about the map, um, that's, that's fine. Of course, if I just know the coordinate, the global coordinate of the robot, but I have on, in, on the world, let's say, the robot has a GPS, I know perfectly where it is on the world, but I have no idea what the world looks like. I have no idea what I'm going to measure. So just the pulse itself doesn't provide me any information. Okay. Now I did that, I'm happy with this term. Now I can do exactly the same with the opposite probability. Instead of P of MI, I can to look into P of not MI. Do the same thing, I will end up with exactly the same equations. You yeah, erase it, but just raise the question. Yeah, uh, I'm just a bit confused. How does the observation ZT uh, rely on the previous observation? Um, the thing is, you just leave the term in here because you say if you would make the statistics about what you observed, you may be able to estimate something about the future. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. okay. if, if you know what you observed, you look to your history of observations, it may tell you something what you are going to observe in the next step. Therefore, I don't want to get rid of that. 
Um, now I can do exactly the same with not empty. I come with exactly the same result. So do exactly the same derivation and, and now use kind of not mi, so that mi is kind of um, means that it's free, the opposite probability. I can exactly that. What I now can do is make a trick that I take uh, the ratio of these two terms. First, if I do the ratio of these two terms, some of those terms are identical, which appear here and appear there, which are hard to compute, which I can get rid of if I just read the ratio of both. That's what I'm going to do. So I take the first one and divide it by the second term. It's exactly what's just written down. This term over here is the ratio, which ends up in this complex ratio over here. But what you can see is this term goes away, but this term they cancel out. And this term, uh, again, here's mark of assumption of remove. This term and this term they cancel out for the prior about the, uh, the observations. If I do that, so just rewriting this, um, eliminating the term which I said, and then I can actually replace p of not mi by 1 minus p of mi. This is the opposite probability. And then I end up with this final equation. So the ratio is computed by the probability that this cell is occupied or not from a single observation taken from a single point, divided by 1 minus that value. This is a recursive term. It's the same term we had up there, just up to the time t minus 1. And I have some prior information about the cells are, if I don't have any information, cells are more likely to be occupied or free, is something I can model with this term. So you can actually write this in. This is a term which I can use for the incremental update that uses a current observation and only the current observation. Now the second term here, which is so called a recursive term, and have a prior over here. You can use model background knowledge for maps, for example. Still, I just have computed this ratio. I have not computed, obtained the probability. I don't have a little second. Are there so far any questions about these steps? So I agree that these steps may look a little bit, I want to say arbitrary, but just take this, take the ratio, but the important thing is we will use this on the next slide to actually compute the probabilities from that. So the recursive term would just be what we have in the bit so far. Yeah. Sorry, the recursive. the recursive term would be what is written in the grid at this moment. Yeah, so before I integrate the next observation, so let's say I start with it. If I start with the first observation, it would be just 0.5 or anything. I include the first observation, that would be the, that one in the recursive term would be simply 0.5, like 0.5 to 1 and 0.5. In the next term, what I computed will be the recursive term, the observation B2 will be taken into account here, and so on. So just that I can separate these processes considering one measurement at a time. Okay. So how do I um, obtain a probability from these terms? There's something which is called a log odds ratio. And this is defined as the probability of an event x divided by 1 minus the probability of this event x. And this is exactly the form we have here. This is 1 minus 2. And the logarithm of that is something that is called a log odds ratio. A lot of computations are done in these log odds ratios. The reason for why one uses this logarithm of this term is that here I have a product of terms. If I take the logarithm of that, product turns into sum. Therefore, people often use log odds to compute these values. So if I have the log odds, this is the formula from which I can, so given the log odds, I can compute the probability of the event x with this simple, simple formula. You can just try it out, put that in there, to really get exactly the original formula. So that's great. So I have this, say, I now want to compute everything in my log odds space, in my log odds space. Taking these terms over here, just take a log of something, just the logarithm of this term, what I use. And I can compute with this, and once I want to compute the real probability, I just put it in this equation. Just take the exponential fraction of the log of term and compute 1 minus 1 uh, divided by 1 plus this term. So that's cool. So what I can do is I can just um, rewrite, rewrite my, my, my formula in log odds notation. The log odds L of mi given all the sense observation is this term over here, this log odds term, 
plus my recursive term minus the prior. It is minus because it's exactly the inverse. And the inverse, if you divide something, take the log, it's minus. So uh, this formula, so I can compute for every grid cell this log odds ratio. And once I want to compute the probability, I just need to compute this 1 minus 1 divided by 1 plus the x of log term. Okay, or if I write it in short, how you often find it in the written. So this is what we call an inverse sensor model. First, the sensor model we used so far was p of that t given x t and mi on the map. That's the sensor model. And here it's actually the balance I've switched. So that p of mi given that t xt, this is called the inverse sensor model. Therefore, you often, in this context, find the following way of writing it. The log odds at time t of cell i is the inverse sensor model, which is just computed um, from the state of the cell and the uh, x, t, and dt. The recursive term, so it's exactly the term over here at the previous point in time, plus l as well. Just a different way of writing this. Because this term is a constant. This is my previous estimate, and this is the only kind of new term which is added. The equation. So I can formulate all that as this very, very simple algorithm, the occupancy algorithm, mapping algorithm. Shout the following. The input is a map represented as log odds notation. So the estimate of the map at the previous point in time. Xt and dt. And then I said the iterator of all cells, I can handle all cells individually. And if the mi is in the perceptual field of the robot, that means the robot observed this cell, I just update this cell, the log odds ratio of this cell, it's its old value, plus the inverse sensor model minus the prior, which is a constant model. Or, I just, if it's not observed, I just copy it over. That's it, I return the value. The key thing is this algorithm is very, very efficient to compute. The reason for this is, it only computes sums of values. You just need to sum values in a two-dimensional grid. So it's very, very efficient. If I then want to compute the probabilities out of this log odds uh, representation, just need to compute this. 1 uh, minus 1 divided by 1 plus x of the log odds. So it's a very, very efficient way to, to estimate the math. OK, so this approach was actually developed by Morabek and Elfes in the 80s. Um, and it was originally developed for doing occupancy grid mapping with the sonar sensor. So the sonar sensor, which is a rather high uncertainty, you assume that your robot knows where it is, you observe obstacles, and will integrate those obstacles. And it's also often called mapping with known poses. So if someone says grid mapping with known poses, it's exactly this algorithm with very good. The only thing we need to specify, which is specific to the sensor, is this so called inverse sensor model. It's just what the estimate will look like of that cell given the observation and given the um, given the uh, observation. Okay, so and this is how it originally looked like. So this is a sonar cone, this is a robot, this is a grid map, and the gray means I don't know anything about it. If I take a plot observation which looks like this, it simply means I'm quite likely this area is free space and that this area is occupied space. So it's not white and black, just joining for illustration, it's just light gray. See, it's light gray and light dark. No, light gray and dark gray. Um, this is what the inverse sensor model is. It tells you the state of a cell given the observation of the robot's pose. So how do we actually compute this term? That is zero, or the small, no, no, sorry, the small value before the obstacle, and then where the obstacle is, or where the, me the measure ranges, there's an obstacle behind it. Okay, just look at the following, just the, be the beams which lie along the optical axis here. Do the same here, but this just easy to show that. 
For this theorem, I can actually model that with a function which looks like this. It looks like this. So this is the measured distance over here. I say in front of the measured distance, it's more likely to be free than occupied. So this is a prior, 0.5, for example. So this area is free space. Everything which is in front of that obstacle is more likely to be free. And then close to the measured distance, I'm, I'm quite not that certain anymore. It's more likely to be perhaps occupied or less likely to be free until I reach the place where I kind of hit it the cell, the hit it the um, the obstacle, and then the obstacle increase, and this is kind of the occupied area here, which is more likely to be occupied. And behind that, as we don't know anything, just make it keep the prior information. And um, so, and, and depending on how thick, the, how, how the distance here can measure, and kind of your prior information, how thick are your obstacles, how thick are the walls. And that's the way this is actually modeled. But this is be knowing for I think. If I simply put that into an algorithm, it looks like this. So this is the current map you have built with a solar reading, the solar set, but actually built with a real robot. That's a robot, this is a current map. And then it takes tw um, 20, oh, 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 uh, 18 scans. These are the individual scans, and you can see that's what one solar always measured. Some are dark, some are a little bit um, more grayish, and some are a bit brighter. That depends on the measured distance, because the closer you measure, the more certain you are about your estimate. You get all these individual estimates, you can integrate that actually into a map, which then looks like this. The way you can actually update the map. This is what the occupancy group occupancy grid mapping algorithm actually does. This is actually one of my first works I did when I started my PhD 10 years ago or something like that. That was the good old model, the first robot we had in the lab. And this is actually a map which is part of the building uh, 79, those are the sonar scanners. Uh, you can see it is much more blurry compared to what you use from the laser scanner, but that's just because these sonars have a wide opening angle, they're super inaccurate and um, but if you integrate this information appropriately, you make sure you get a map from solar information which looks like this. And once you have that estimate here, so this is a, this is a occupancy probability uh, for every cell. It's wide, it's more likely to be zero. So close to zero is completely wide, close to um, black, and there's also grayish values here in the middle bit, just in a single measurement. You can actually compute from this. Um, the most likely map by just kind of rounding those values to 0 and 1, then you get this map over here, which is kind of the most likely map. That's the most likely map that can compute in this information. Just saying, every, every cell which is a value bigger than 0.5, put it to occupy. Every cell which is a value smaller than 0.5, put it to 0. This is just the most likely estimate. So it's true and false. These are all true and false values. Okay, how would you expect does such um, say it looked like for a laser range scanner. Such a map look for a laser range scanner. Much more like sharp. Yeah. Exactly. So how would the sensor model look like? Um, yeah, maybe more like yeah. more like a step function because it'd be a, you're more accurate. You narrow that down to a really, really small area. That's exactly. And you can compare the maps to the maps you obtain from a laser range scanner. So if these are your pure laser range scans you obtain. So you see here some, some dynamic obstacles walking around. You can integrate that into a grid map and you get something like this. It's one of the one of the maps you obtain from laser range scanners. This is another map here, um, one of the standard data sets. You'll find a couple of web pages. MIT CSAI lab, third floor, driving around with the robot, mapping the environment. This is what it looks like. Some of these kind of grayish areas. It's because this is a handrail. Sometimes the scanner looks through the through, through. Sometimes it gets a reflection that was kind of a bit grayish. We have another example. It's actually a small video of a robot driving around building 106 here, building a map while it is driving through the environment. And you can see all the maps not updated where the robot is, drives through the environment, navigates around. And this is actually a very efficient, very simple process. So given you know the process, this was the big assumption of occupancy grid mapping. You can compute this grid maps quite easily. Okay, so to sum that up, um, what the occupancy grid maps do is 
They discretize the space into grid cells, 2D grid of cells, and every cell is supposed to be either completely free or completely occupied. They use a binary random variable to represent that. They assume a static state, so no change in the map, and apply a static state binary based filter, so quite straightforward thing. Um, so it's pretty easy to do, given you know the process, so it's easy. And the log odds notation is one way for actually computing those values very, very efficiently. And um, so if you have such a sampler, there's no need for computing predefined features. So next week, we're going to use these occupancy grid maps to actually do SWIM and building these kind of dense maps or grid maps um, with particle filter based approach. As well as, again, literature about that. So, Progressive Robotics book, chapter 4.2. Is a short description of the binary uh, state based filter with the log odds updating, kind of two pages, and then the occupancy group mapping itself is explained in uh, chapter 9 and 1. Are there questions so far regarding occupancy group mapping? Yes, please. <laughs> if we, about the formula um, that you had, the long formula, the end, the end formula for the probability. Yeah. Uh, it's not like a prior, why is it this way and not the other way? Uh, so yeah. this one? The prior at the end. Yeah. Why is it not the other way? Because um, it results from the original formula. Okay. If you go here, you get P of MI here in the... Uh, so this guy cancel out. This is just the error. This guy's cancel out. So you have to put this one up here and this one goes down here. Mm -hmm. So it's just... Therefore, this is the other way around and therefore you have the minus instead of the plus. Okay. Okay, any further questions? Okay, so thank you very much, and see you next week, last time before Christmas. And then we kind of do the particle filter based approach, and then we are also kind of finishing the particle filter based approaches next week, and then in the new year we will look to some new fancy technique in the kind of the third building block of SLAM approaches. Okay, thank you very much.